Hello, everybody. Welcome to this talk with Jonathan Coe. So uh, Jonathan and I actually already recorded a talk for the symposium before the symposium started. And, and then we realized that the, um, the quality of the internet was going in and out <laughs> throughout the talk. So we realized it would be smart to re-record it and also um, we're recording this now on July 1st, 2022. So the symposium has already taken place technically, but as I've explained to everyone, um, the symposium is going to be available indefinitely. And I'm going to actually be continuing to interview people over the coming months. And then we're going to have, we're going to do a part two in 2023 at some point. So probably next summer is my guess. Um, and so this is wonderful that we get to revisit all of this. Um, and what Jonathan is speaking about is actually so important to me and, and fits in really well with my one and only sort of regret around the symposium. Um, so Jonathan's talk is called Mercury as Psychopomp and it, he's gonna be talking about the non-binary um, realities of the world. And before we start, I just want to say, you know, again, in the symposium, I, I, I have this one, one thing I feel sad about, which is that in the panel discussions, the way I organized it, um, there were four topics. One was the divine feminine, the divine masculine, <clears throat> returning to wholeness, and then transmuting the shadow. And they were one, every single one of them was amazing, wonderful, et cetera. Um, but I didn't have, like, I almost am crying. So I really, truly, genuinely feel really sad about this. I didn't have one dedicated to non-binary realities or like, as one participant put it, you know, what about talking about divine people, you know, instead of divine feminine, divine masculine, why not divine people? I get chills <laughs> hearing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And um Anyway, so, and actually in the Divine Masculine panel, uh, that's where this person participant said, why, why what, what's the advantage to dichotomizing the Divine Feminine and Divine Masculine? Why don't we talk about the Divine person? And what ended up happening in that panel discussion, which I highly recommend everyone watch, uh, was that the conversation went off the chart. Like, like I was thinking, okay, cool. This person is asking this question in the chat and we'll, we'll like maybe two or three people can address the question because it's a really important question. And then we'll move on to other stuff about the divine masculine, but that's not what happened. The whole rest of the, the whole rest of the time for that panel was all about this question of, you know, what are the pros and cons of, of focusing on the polarities versus the non-binary or gender fluidity or whatever you want to, whatever way you want to frame it. Yeah. Um, and so, and that, that panel was the most out of all four of them, by far the most energized people didn't want to stop talking. <laughs> like it just kept going and going. And so we went about 30 minutes overtime because wow. it was so, there was so much energy around this question and, and mm. just in general, I think, the people on the panel felt like a hunger to talk about all of it, like divine masculine, divine feminine, divine person. Like there was just so much need for that, um, which was really, really interesting and really cool. But anyway, so then when I finished up the symposium, I, I still, like I said, I've really, like I could start crying like right now. <laughs> I really feel sad that I didn't do that. So I feel grateful that you and I now can kind of come back full circle and re-record this talk about the non-binary and share your perspective on the whole thing. And yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, more to come. Like this is obviously not just it, you know. Thank our you, world, Martha. Yeah, our world needs this conversation in lots of ways, so. Yeah, and thank you so much for doing the symposium because I think it's so needed. And also the way you are coming into this and the perspectives you have. And, and I, I've told you this in, in private many times, but I just really feel your heart 
throughout the symposium. Mm -hmm. And there are so many events out there where there's a lot of people involved and you just feel like this frantic energy. But I think with you, I feel so cared for, so held. And I think it really is a testament to who you are as a person and the power of your practice and, and what you're bringing together here, the kinds of inspiration you're serving. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. <laughs> So yeah, you have a beautiful, beautiful presentation that I get to experience again. Yay. Without uh, internet interruptions this time, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> yes. Oh, no. So far, so good. Yay, yay, yay. Yeah. So um, do you want to just begin or do you want to say anything? Yeah. Let's do that. Let's do that. Yes. Um, oh, and I need to uh, give you permission to share, actually. Hang on one second. Okay. So yes, I do, I have prepared a PowerPoint uh, presentation just because there was a lot that I wanted to convey through this talk. And there was a lot that kind of emerged as I was doing a lot of reflection, thinking, research, pondering my own personal work, a lot surfaced. So um, really the point of the PowerPoint slides is really to, keep me on track because I am a Mercury's child and it's very easy for me to swim away somewhere. I have Mercury in Pisces, which we're going to talk about in a second. And um, yeah, but, but really, um, I also said this to Martha beforehand, but if, if at any point um, there are particular reflections or parts of the presentation that feel more important to spend time on in this moment that we're speaking right now, we can definitely do that. And I'm happy to also maybe skip over some other parts um, if time is a concern. So I am going to share my screen. Oh, sorry, before you, I forgot to read your bio. Oh yeah, <laughs> you wanna do that? do that? Okay. Okay, so uh, Jonathan Ko, whose pronouns are they and he, is a queer mystic who li currently lives in Brooklyn, New York land of the Lenape people. Weaving music, astrology, tarot, energy healing, and the Akashic perspective into their practice, Jonathan aims to empower the collective through, through compassionate discernment, to nurture communities of passionate seekers, and to expand our sense of interconnectedness beyond the collective myths of binary thinking and not enoughness. In 2019, Jonathan released their first singer-songwriter record, Elementary Love under the moniker Nate Chi. Jonathan has released, uh, uh, Jonathan has recently launched a podcast called Healing the Spirit. Yay. You know? <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Martha. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know you're probably seeing a lot of things on my screen. I'm going to pull up this presentation. And we're entering the full screen world. Awesome. Okay, so this presentation I am titling Mercury as Psychopomp, Rewriting Our Relationship to the Binary. So a little bit about me, I am a Virgo rising, I'm a Pisces sun and a Gemini moon, and my Mercury is in detriment and in fall in Pisces, and as Martha and I have learned, um, it behooves me not to record presentations during Mercury retrograde. So I'm learning my lesson. Um, <laughs> I, I don't hold a lot of identities um, with a lot of seriousness. I, I think I really try to live my life um, bringing in humor because that is not, that does not feel like the default to me and, and that was not how I was raised. But if I have to refine um, or narrow down my identities that I really feel in my heart, I would say I'm definitely a mystic. I am a creative and I am a dreamer. And um, part of my spiritual and one would even say human praxis has to do with weaving the... Um, modalities of astrology, music, 
statistics, Akashic Records, Tarot, Energy Healing, um, and I'm trained in a few different lineages of energy healing. Um, and also my astrology practice, as you can guess, you know, as a Mercury's child, again, um, is quite wide ranging. I am trained in Hellenistic astrology, um, evolutionary astrology, and I also dabble in archetypal astrology. So all of that informs my practice. I identify as a queer non-binary person. I use the they, he pronoun. And also I want to say that I don't really have a formal gender studies degree. I've never studied uh, gender studies in, in any sort of higher institution. So um, a lot of this is really coming from my own experience, which we're going to talk more about. So the orientation to my practice, but specifically in this talk, is um, are the following. And, and I think this is really important to center because a lot of us come into spaces where maybe we learn or we consume content or we engage with ideas. And subconsciously or consciously, we always bring trauma that we've experienced in educational system. And, and so often, um, I think that's brought up a lot. And, and I want to always center that because this is part of my story as well. So I, I want to be very clear about where I'm coming from with this talk. The first piece that I'm going to bring in here is that um, my, ori my first orientation is really around how to embody Mercury. So um, what that means to me is that I'm going to be bringing in a lot of my own personal experiences and my personal gnosis as well as well as other people's stories and I try my best to really occupy a non-expert space so I do consider myself a scholar and I don't just think of scholarly things as research citation but also poetry and, and metaphors to me are something that I study as well and I take seriously. And I also bring in non-traditional ways of knowing because in the Western way of looking at the world, the way that we have been taught as what is real and what is not real, certain ways of knowing are not considered real. Right, like when we get our intuition, people call that a coincidence, you know. So, even just changing our words, right, from maybe coincidence to synchronicity changes the implication of our experiences so much. And so, I really want to also invite you in this moment, in this space, to allow yourself to receive this information on an intuitive level rather than, than just intellectual. I love myself. Um, the, the nerdiness of doing my research, reading the books, reading the myths, and also whenever we're talking about myths, right, and we're talking about things like astrology, it is not, um, the written word does not hold primacy, right, and there's so much we don't know about the culture from which the written word comes from, and so when we harden into assumptions around this is exactly what it means, I think we get into very difficult territory and very dangerous territory. And also this talk to me is really inv invitational. Um, I invite you to suspend any sort of moral judgment and presuppose that there's no one specific destination we're getting to here. We're, we're just exploring. We're just inviting ourselves into spaces that feel resonant or if none of this talk feels resonant, then that's wonderful too. That's, I, I always say that your no is just as valuable as your yes. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, this is you know my mercur mercurial nature probably um, seeping in that I really want to invite us into this probably what feels like subversive way of looking at history. Um, recognizing that history is built upon oppressive values, right? Even just the word history, why is it not her story? You know, there's, there's so much um, that needs to be investigated there. 
and I want to, to invite us to affirm that imagination is a valid tool for creating new worlds, that our imagination in this culture has either been ostracized or it has been capitalized, right? Ostracized, you know, um, I, I actually have a degree in, in um, economics and statistics. And, you know, if I, if I in that realm say that, oh, I have this way of approaching techniques with imagination, I will just be met with a side eye, right? And also at the, at the same time, you see industries, and this is not, again, a judgment, but you see industries like Disney, you know, making so much money, right, out of the idea of imagination. And what does that say about imagination? And what happens? What is the implication for us when our imaginations are rarefied, right? Is, is con considered this thing that we don't have access to or is only available in certain spaces. So, um, yes. So let's begin with talking about the psychopomp. So some of you may be familiar with this term. Some other people may be not familiar. So here is a standard definition that I found. I believe this is, I found this on Wikipedia um, because there was another definition um, in the Webster dictionary, but I didn't find that to be as mm, resonant for me as this one. So Wikipedia says, psychopomps are creatures, spirits, or deities whose responsibility is to escort newly deceased souls from earth to the afterlife. The etymology of psychopomp is interesting because obviously a lot of us, especially those who have studied astrology, know the, this word psyche, right? Which um, can be defined as the animating principle of a human or an animal body, vital spirit, soul, life, and also butterfly, right? So the word psyche is the Greek for butterfly. So I just thought that's interesting to bring in and to kind of tickle our imagination. And the word pompos um, means conductor, guide, attendant, guard. So as a musician, the word conductor here really speaks to me because perhaps for, for a, a person uh, not immersed in the world of music, the word conductor maybe brings up this idea of a train, right? But for me, the conductor is the person who is leading the orchestra, right? But also the conductor doesn't play any instrument. The conductor is bringing something out of this body of beings with talent and intelligence. So to me, there's something really evocative here, right, about the idea that the psychopomp um, bring something out that is not in their own body or not in their own being, but really kind of inviting in something into being that is dormant within the other person or the other thing, right? So, you know, it would be... Um, not a complete research if we don't bring our friend Carl Jung. So I, I want to bring in this idea that Carl Jung spoke about. So in the work of Carl Jung, if you are familiar with his work, um, there's the idea of the anima and the animus, right? So the anima is sort of the unconscious feminine side of a man, and the animus is the unconscious or archetypal uh, un masculine side of a woman. Right. And again, this language is very binary. Right. But we can also honor the fact that that's the um, Carl Jung is not this figure on the Mount Olympus that is always right. Right. Carl Jung is not a deity. <laughs> Carl Jung is a human who came, whose work came out of a particular um, a particular ecosystem. Right. Of thoughts, beliefs, philosophies, culture. And so. Um, there is, in, in one of um, Carl Jung's work, uh, Vision Seminar, he had mentioned for the animus when on his way, on his quest, is really a psychopomp, leading the soul to the stars whence it came. On the way back out of the existence in the flesh, the psychopomp develops such a cosmic aspect. He wanders among the constellations, he leads the soul 
over the rainbow bridge into the blossoming fields of the stars. Absolutely. Very beautiful, right? It's just, I mean, right, Martha? This is just so <laughs> poetic. And also, like, my mind is here, like, what is this person talking about? <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I found this, um, this person who is a um, Jung uh, scholar, but also I think this person is, is involved in other, um, this person seems to be a bit of a jack of all trades as well. Um, but in his work, he wrote, as in many respects, the complement of the ego, the anima or animus is the nearest archetype of the collective unconscious. Therefore, they are natural psychopomps who may introduce us to the noeric order where they and the other gods reside. Because of this nearness, the anima of a man may serve as a muse, a source of creativity and feeling, a representative of the Eros principle, leading the man to the unconscious and the soul. Analogously, the animus of a woman may be a source of rational purposefulness, a representative of the logos principle, leading upward to the spirit. Perhaps, therefore, in a woman, the animus is more akin to a hero than a muse. So I thought this is interesting because um, it speaks to how there is a part of us, right? This is how I understand it. How there's a part of us that perhaps is dormant, whether by nature or whether by nurture within us, that seeks to be on this journey across the life to complete us right so when we're maybe socialized more as a masculine person with all the baggage around what masculine means in a particular society there's also a part of us inside that wants to to help us integrate what is on the other end right so so that um and, and then the role of the psychopomp, right, is really to mediate between the unconscious and the conscious. And this is something that I think is interesting. And um, yeah, and, and I think adds richness to this definition of what, how we can think of the role of the psychopomp. So before we move on to Mercury Hermes, I'm curious if you have any thoughts that you want to share Martha or anything um, that I mean, feels alive mm -hmm. the only thing that's just coming up for me is that I do struggle a lot with the anima animus concept in general it feels I feel I feel irritated <laughs> by it mm -hmm. <laughs> in general to be told like that's my that's my really honest feeling in my body when when people talk about it in general um it feels limiting it feels constricting for me <laughs> yeah and anyway so i i'm just enjoying hearing your perspective and what you're saying but um mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and i think that's a that's such a valid point i i do too first of all mm -hmm. <laughs> i feel the same way and i think for me it's it's always really interesting to to ask this question of um how does how does that make sense right what is the role of that concept in the ecology that Carl Jung came from, right? Mm -hmm. I think there's something very subversive about that idea too, because imagine, you know, prior to him saying this idea of there's a woman inside a man, there's a man inside yeah. a woman, yes, right? Yes. It was all, always very kind of hard. Um, I don't know, I imagine, right? I, I'm not a, a scholar in that sense, but I imagine that social, you know, in terms of um, the sociology of that time, there's this very um, hard line, right, between yes. what a man is and what a woman is. Absolutely. And also, to your point, I think we can do better now. Yeah, yeah. You know, we are in right. 2022, right? Let's right. let's think about other ways to think about this and not get stuck in what Carl Jung was saying about whatever, right? right. Yes. Thank yes, you. I agree <laughs> with all of that. <laughs> Yes. So Mercury, um, I, I'm going to go through this part relatively quickly because the point here is not to get super, to me, the point is not to get super scholarly about this. The point here is to really allow this 
wide ranging associations and stories and um, correspondences to infuse our space, infuse our mind at this moment with what Mercury may be and what Mercury is kind of pointing towards. So the etymology of the word Mercury came from potentially, there's apparently a lot of debate about this, the Latin Merx, which can be translated to merchandise or Mercari, which is to trade. And then um, there's also this, argument that there's the Proto-Indo-European word of Merck, which means boundary, or Merck, which means border, right? And then Hermes came from the Greek Herma, which uh, is can be translated to a heap of stones or cairn, often used as trail or boundary markers. And so there's this idea of Mercury being the merchant, right? And the keeper of boundaries, which is interesting because a merchant we think of as someone who crosses boundaries, right? Who, who moves things or items from one place to the other. And then the, the idea of the keeper of boundaries maybe have a bit more rigidity to it. But um, I think that also already speaks to this non-dual um, nature of Mercury, right? On a felt sense. When we think about Mercury from the perspective of the um, myth, and the mythology, right? Uh, Mercury was the child of Jupiter or Zeus and Maya, who is a nymph um, and a daughter of Atlas. Through an affair with Venus, Mercury bore a child called um, Hermaphroditos, who was androgynous and later merged his body with his female lover. So I think this is really the only instance where someone is um, in the mythology, the Greek mythology, is so clearly both male and female. Um, and then also something to mention about Mercury is Mercury had male lovers, including the hero uh, Perseus. When you see Mercury um, in mythologies or in stories, you can tell that it's Mercury because Mercury tends to be wearing a broad brimmed hat, winged sandals, a purse, and a herald's wand, or also called the caduceus. Um, and in terms of prominence, Mercury invented the lyre, played a hymn that celebrated his own birth, right? Which I think is just so, like, that really tickles my imagination, thinking about, here's this god who is like, I don't need anybody else, right, to be singing this, um, to be celebrating me. I can celebrate myself. There's a self-sufficiency to Mercury. <clears throat> Mercury is the messenger god, right? he was really the only one in Mount Olympus who could travel between the upper world, the middle world, and the underworld, I should add here, without having to pay a price, right? Because others can do that, but they often have to pay a price, whether that's um, they have to transform or they have to let go of something, but Mercury has um, free access, right? It's, it's like um, Mercury has an unlimited subway ride between um, the upper, the middle, and the underworld. Mercury was the inventor of speech associated with oratory or interpretation. So Mercury, um, we can get a sense here that Mercury is not tied or uh, stuck to particular meanings. Mercury opens up, right, the realm of possibility for other perspectives and other views. And also Mercury was the one who found Persephone in the underworld and aided in her return to her mother Ceres and escorted Persephone then back and forth when Persephone was in this um, agreement, right, of having spent, having to spend half of the world above ground and having to spend the rest of the, the year underground. So Mercury is also known as the conductor, the leader of souls, patron of travelers and thieves, shepherd of men, the trickster. I think it's interesting that in traditional astrology, this is something that I know uh, Joe also talked about in their talk, right? About how Mercury is neither malefic or benefic, is neither diurnal or nocturnal and neither masculine nor feminine. And some astrological associations uh, with Mercury has to do with eloquence, with commerce, cunning, astrology, music, dreams, education, numbers, calculations, geometry, youth, sending messages, divination, braiders and weavers, 
hands, shoulders, fingers, hearing, belly, tongue, and copper. So um, that's a very long list of the things that Mercury can be associated with. And I think it points to all the different ways that Mercury can show up, right, as an archetype. Okay, so I'm going to change uh, direction here a little bit, change pace. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my life story because I find that as a pedagogical teaching tool, telling a person's life story is important because um, sometimes when we don't know about people's life story, we can put them on a pedestal or, or not really fully understand where they're coming from. So my intention in sharing this is to, to help you situate yourself by me situating myself, right? And seeing where our experiences differ and where maybe we um, will, you know, have similar life experiences that lead to similar conclusions or to different conclusions, or maybe where we have different life experiences that may potentially lead to the same conclusion. Right. So all of that is always interesting. And I want to just bring myself here as a human and you are human, too. And it's not that, you know, any of us know more than than the other, but we're just kind of sharing perspectives here. So I grew up in Jakarta, Indonesia. I moved to the U.S. at age 17 to study music. And I mostly descended from um, Chinese immigrants and settlers in Indonesia, um, referred to as Peranakan. And we kind of occupy this interesting liminal space between being targets of political oppression and also engaging in practices and ways of being that perhaps consciously, other times subconsciously for survival, economically oppress indigenous peoples in Indonesia. And, and also something I should mention is that Indonesian language doesn't recognize gender in direct pronouns. So the first, I don't know, 10 or so years of my life, when all I was really speaking was primarily Indonesian, I grew up with this uh, linguistic framework where there's no differentiation, right, between uh, the man or the woman, even though it's probably more complicated than that, because recently I also remember, oh yeah, when we call our aunts and uncles, they're actually gendered. Uh, terms for these. So it's not completely non-gendered, but when we're just talking about a person in third person, we don't say he, she, we just kind of say they. And um, a little bit about my childhood. I was an extremely curious child with my Gemini moon. I was physically very, very active. I have Saturn um, and Mars conjunct in Capricorn. I was deeply connected and attracted to the flamboyant, the flashy. Um, my south node is in Leo. So I would be wearing my grandmother's high heels. I would try on my mom's lipstick. Um, people were not happy about that. <laughs> my aunt's colorful um, teenage girls magazines. And I also always had this sense, this deep felt sense that the, the gender binary and maybe binaries in general are just not real. So that was something that I feel I kind of came into this world with. Um, and I experienced a lot of gender related bullying from ages 11 to 17. I was called names. Um, there were classmates hacking into my social media account, writing um, really hurtful things. And throughout this time, music was truly a balm and a friend. And at the same time, I also had this really intense shame around and and this desire to kind of be hiding my voice for some weird reason um, that felt to me much more connected to maybe past life experiences rather than things that happen in this uh, life. Mm -hmm. And I also grew up um, with a religious upbringing, um, particularly the Christian evangelical and Calvinist trans there were a lot of messages around strict gender roles about what men and women should be like or should do or how marriage was supposed to be between men and women and, and also that there were very clear gender roles within those uh, relationships, right? And this really 
you know, as I don't think I need to go on a whole lecture about this, but this goes, this ripples out into the ways we organize as a community as well, right? It's not just within marriage, but also how we are with each other. And um, I always joke about this uh, straight box that people are put into, right? Like how people are supposed to act with their neighbors, with uh, the, you know, other people in the uh, parent-teacher associations, right? It, it ripples out everywhere. And for me, I really have been on this really slow journey to finding my own voice as an adult, which is interesting thinking about Mercury ruling the voice, right? And me being a Virgo rising with my Mercury rule chart, I've really needed to find a way to, to find my own voice and that path with my um, detriment and fallen Mercury has, has just not been an easy or straightforward path. So I came out as queer at age 21. I finally um, achieved my long lifelong ambition, dream, fantasy of releasing my singer-songwriter album when I was 29. And interestingly enough, I had a lot of fantasy around how that's going to help me you know, live this completely different life and all that stuff. And none of that happened. It was a beautiful experience of releasing my music. And also it was not something that, you know, changed my life 180. So I think I fell into a little bit of a, I wouldn't call it depression, but definitely a dissolution of my reality and my idea of who I am, what's real. And I intentionally embarked on the path of Kind of reclaiming remembering my essence as a spiritual being around this time and i found the language for my non-binary gender experience i wrote identity here but i think experience is more uh resonant at age 30. so i really didn't come into this until you know a, a few years ago so so my point here is that we are always all on an ever evolving journey and our journey is not separated from the collective right like whatever the collective is going through we're also in, in some sense going through and and questioning and investigating hmm. i feel like I, I should pause and uh curious to hear any thoughts you may have martha or we can um no i was on. just so just to clarify so you're now like 32 33 i'm 32 mm -hmm. 32 yeah yeah so yeah, like we reflected before, this is all relatively new for you in a certain way. Yeah. Um, and I'm also just reflecting that astrologically, you, you and I have so much in common. You know, I have Virgo rising. I have a Virgo moon instead of a Gemini moon, but then we, our birthdays are one day apart. Yes. Yeah. yeah so it's amazing. So we have, we both have um, sun in Pisces. Is your sun in your seventh? house yes and, yeah yes. right mm -hmm. so we both have sun in pisces and seventh house we both have mercury in pisces um anyway yeah a and and then we both grew up internationally mm -hmm. um anyway and we have lots of differences too and so, and so i'm just i'm not drawing any conclusions i'm just sort of reflecting on the whole you know how life works <laughs> yeah very... yeah i i think it's it's wonderful and and i love how our paths met also through our mutual friend reina borel who yeah. uh, doesn't live in the u.s right who's yeah. also um based in in um i think she just moved to austria actually ne like maybe next or week she's moving or something yes next yeah. week she's yeah. moving yeah. yeah so it's interesting to think about how we're kind of connected in such a powerful way um yes thank you for that yeah and of course, I identify with lots of the mercurial things that you're describing, you know, I, not so much my, well, my gender identity, I would say a little bit, but more my sexual orientation is mm. uh, pansexual, right? So it's, I mean, the whole, like, being able to move between worlds and just open to kind of life, life as yeah. life, it definitely resonates for me. And anyway, yeah. <laughs> But, what did you feel was your um did, did you also feel like you kind of came into it more gradually martha or was it more like a you know, there were 
I will. Well, one thing that I, I definitely have reflected on is that my, I would say my gender identity and sexual orientation both feel fluid. Like I feel like, uh, I'm 45. So I'm significantly older. I mean, like, I'm like a half generation older than you. And when I was 19, 20, 20 college age, um, I look back on it and at that point I identified as bisexual, but the word non-binary didn't, wasn't a thing yet that was, nobody was taught. I mean, there were definitely people who were transgender, um, but the whole non-binary thing, even though I went to a, a hippie, hippie, hippie college where, you know, it was weird to be straight. Like if you're, if you're straight, there's something off because that doesn't make sense, you know? Um, uh, <clears throat> but nobody, nobody talked about the non-binary or gender fluidity or anything like that. Um, and I think at that time in my life, um, I, if that had been a concept that I knew about, probably I would have identified as gender fluid ish or something. There was a moment in when I was 19, I shaved my head and I decided I wanted to be a lesbian separatist. <laughs> so I don't know. Anyway, that didn't last very long. Cause I realized pretty quickly that I'm, I am attracted to men too. So <laughs> that's not going to work. Um, but, uh, but there was, you know, I really, I, there was a time when it was really important in my own development to go into myself as feeling the masculine and feminine. And I, but I didn't have words to put to it yet. Yeah. yeah. And at this point in my life, uh, now I do have words to put to it. And, you know, like last summer, I was very deeply in love with a transgender woman right so so suddenly like bisexual didn't make sense mm -hmm. um it needs to be pansexual because excuse me like <laughs> i realize of course i'm gonna fall in love with people regardless of their gender and that's just who i am so um pan makes so much more sense and and at the same time i would say in terms of my gender identity it, it's more cisgender like i'm I'm feeling really enjoying my feminine nature, you know, and, but, yeah. but I have a very strong, really deeply important relationship to the masculine energies in me too. And the non-binary is, it's still, it, I'm still exploring it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I would call it gradual. I would, maybe I would call it more like fluid and changing and dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I love that. Thank you. I think, I think um, it, it speaks to, I love how we were both talking about our experiences here, because I think it speaks to the wide range of experiences people have. And it's almost, I think, was it Joe who said in, in the other talk about how gender is almost kind of like a name, like you can't think that two Ashleys are going to be the same, you know, that's yeah. oh, an absurd, yeah. Yeah. that's an absurd assumption to make, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. for sure. That was really uh, resonating with me. I was like, yes, bring it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. So here are some of my attempts to contextualize the idea of the gender binary. So to me, the, the gender binary really is the societal construction or limitation of gender expression into strictly two categories, men and woman and nothing else, right? And um, it, it's kind of interesting because when I think about the non-binary, I remember when I first, when, when that word came, I was like, ooh, what was that? And then when I, when I started investigating it further, found deep resonance. And also I should say, even though in terms of identifying with my brain, my non-binary identity, I think I've always had the non-binary experience, right? I've always had, I've always known on a, on a soul level that I had a particular experience that's not similar to people who identify strictly as man and woman. Like my experience is something else and I didn't have a word for it. And um, not having the word and not being able to identify it came with its own difficulties. Even though, you know, as a mercury, mercurial person, I love things, things being in, in this bind, you know, liminal space. Um, and at the same time, I, I also understand that 
having the words for it change everything so much. So when I think about the non-binary, it's not this, um, it's not this like niche thing. I think in the beginning I was like, oh, you know, there's a very small minority of people who have that experience, but I'm almost more thinking about it now as, you know, here's the experience of what it means to be a man, right? And, and the, you know, a little funny thing about this diagram was that the last iteration of this, when Martha and I last spoke, was a solid line of a circle. And then I thought, hmm, something didn't resonate there. And I realized, okay, let's make this a dotted line. So there is some porousness, right? But still largely sitting on this idea or this societal projection about what it means to be a man and then what it means to be a woman, right? And then there's everything else out there kind of being non-binary is how I think about it. And so to me, this space is really, kind of large, right? And and unruly and wild and and there's a lot of possibilities. There's possibilities for for changing, for mutating. Recently, someone that I respect within this community um, came out and said, you know, I no longer identify with they, them pronoun. I'm going to start using she, her pronoun now. And I, I think there's something really beautiful about that, right? Because how we identify, how we express ourselves should be our business mm -hmm. and I think to me there's um opportunity for opening up conversations about this and we'll we'll, we'll talk about um that can I in say one thing about that um, absolutely just as a side note that my 15 year old you know identifies as gender fluid and mm -hmm. and um but goes by any pronouns and so we've been having some of these conversations like what pronoun he they prefer and what he said to me is honestly I don't know it changes every few days some days it really bothers me to be to hear myself called he and some days I identify as he and some days I would like to be uh thought of as a like I would like someone to look at me and think I'm a girl and <laughs> some days I don't know so so what I'm starting to do is just check in every week or two and to say so what pronouns are you wanting right now <laughs> you know mm -hmm. like like it's a it's a whole different experience as, especially as a parent um but i kind of am wondering if that's part of maybe a healthy thing to do in general in the world like just check in you know i don't know like with maybe one day it'll feel one way and one maybe the next day it'll feel a different way and that yeah. should be okay you know that should be part of what's accepted and respected and honored um, yes but it's still realizing a few yeah. fluidity yeah. Yeah. yeah right right yeah sorry i cut you off oh no that, that's just it like i mean it's i'm still in a learning curve with a big learning curve with it um that's part of part of what i've been kind of sitting with or mulling mulling over is yeah, maybe that's, that's just part of what, you know, you check in with people. Oh, so like, you'll check in with people about lots of things, somebody who's really close to you. What are you needing today? Like, are you needing rest? Or are you needing? Mm -hmm. Do you are you feeling the need to be with people? Or do you need time alone? Like, you might be checking in about all kinds of things. And then to have, you know, pronouns and gender identity be something else that you check in on. Why not? Like, yeah. why not include that? Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's such a powerful point. And I feel like a lot of um, parents who want to honor their kids experience will really, yeah, resonate with that experience, Martha, because, and it's interesting, right, because I don't have a child, but I also, as I'm entering my 30s, have been going through this huge experience of checking in with myself, you know, where am I today? Yeah. who am I today and things are always changing and and sometimes you have a word for it and sometimes you have no word for it yeah but but it's interesting and and I should say too that in my podcast the first question I always ask people is who do you feel sense or know yourself to be in this present moment and some people would say I don't know and then start you know going on the super poetic and beautiful and amazingly human description of where they feel themselves to be at the moment and I think 
yeah, asking the art of asking questions is highly underrated in our culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And listening, like actually, actually, once you ask the question, actually wanting to hear the answer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. So in this slide, I, I kind of shared a little bit about um, what I think the non-binary is not. And then later we'll talk about what I think the, the non-binary is, right? First of all, it is not a rule. It's not a competition. It's not a spectrum. So I don't think that there's any right or wrong way to be non-binary. And really my point here is that you may know a person who identifies as non-binary, who is in a female body, who is very femme, right? Who is in their experience or in, in the way they they project themselves onto the world is very comfortable with bringing their um, conventionally uh, thought of as femme side, right? Or, you know, um, somebody could be in a male body and could be femme presenting and also identify as non-binary. So, so my point is that, you know, if, as an example, right, a femme presenting person in a female body is just as non-binary as a femme presenting person in a male body, if that's what they identify as. Right. And it also doesn't negate the societal violence and isolation that a person experiences due to their gender expression and how aligned it is to their um, biological uh, sex, right? And whether they are male or female or perceived by society as male or female. And also, you know, to be non-binary doesn't mean that you have to express yourself exclusively through the they, them pronoun, right? Some people use multiple pronouns. You just mentioned, Martha, your, um, one of your children, right? Identifying with all the pronouns. And some people use no pronoun. They just say, just, just say my name, right? Just every time you want to refer to me, say Jonathan. That's, that works for me. Um, and also the non-binary experience or identity is not an attack or criticism towards those who identify as a man or woman, right? Just because someone is um, identifying with the non-binary identity doesn't mean that you can't, you can't be a man or a woman, right? It doesn't say that everybody has to be non-binary. And it's also not a box that one will be trapped in for the rest of one's life. We already talked about this a little bit. So a person can decide that the non-binary label no longer fits their experience. And that's, that's beautiful and powerful. And also something that I like to mention is that acknowledging, learning more about what it means to um, have relationship with people who identify as having a non-binary identity or non-binary experience is not another reason, right, to feel guilty about all the ways that you couldn't keep up. This is something that I hear a lot, especially from folks who are, um, you know, who have more lived experience in this lifetime, right, who have experienced a lot of changes uh, societally, maybe in their lifetime, and just, you know, kind of start to have this experience of, oh, you know, why can't I stop learning, right? I'm, I already know, I've already been in this world for X number of years, and why can't the world just kind of stay the same? You know, it's so exhausting to have to, to update and keep up. And to that, I will say, um, lovingly and compassionately, whenever there's a new update on your iPhone, you update your phone, right? So I would just say, you know, that there, this is not, I think that in our perspective and our philosophy. It's easy to, to take these experiences as something that is um, a way to, to blame ourselves. And I want to really begin asking, right, what, what is, first of all, maybe going deeper into why is that blame? Why is that self-blame there? Right. If if you're feeling a lot of discomfort listening to this talk right now, or like, oh, you know, I can't keep up. Right. Well, why why do you feel the need to keep up? Right. Or or why do you feel like not keeping up will keep you away from belonging? And 
And I also think that maybe we can give ourselves a lot of compassion that we don't have to understand. We don't have to fully catch up, but it's really more about opening to the, the idea that there are experiences that there are different than us, right? And it doesn't have to be threatening. It doesn't have to point to uh, our experiences not being valid. I think this is to me what is at the core of this concern, right? Or, or sometimes people say, I feel really uncomfortable using the they, them pronoun because it feels grammatically wrong. And I fully honor that. And I also would, would ask, you know, if that's your experience, ask you to reflect, right? Is that maybe perhaps more an indication of some grief that you have around, um, around the ways in which your education system has failed you? And maybe how greater systemic failures have excluded you from certain experiences that you also want to experience. And that actually it may have nothing to do with people who identify as non-binary, right? That, that some of that, um, we change language all the time. Like the other day I was thinking about the use of the word like. It's interesting to me that folks who were maybe born in the 50s or the 40s don't use the word like the way that I use it as someone born in the 90s, right? Or maybe Martha uses it, you know? So, so it's interesting to be thinking about how word evolves all the time and how we evolve all the time. And I think um, if there's a lot of grief around the changing of society, that's also valid, right? And um, perhaps from your heart, you want to, to validate and affirm other people's experiences. And that may require some, some education or some research and some of that may feel not fun. And that's okay too, you know? There's nothing wrong with not liking things. So I, I really just want to put the guilt outside of the box of our conversation now. Like there's no guilt. You are not doing anything wrong. We are all in this earth playing, experimenting, trying, connecting, failing, succeeding, right? And it's always a movable state. Well, and I, I want to say also, I told you before we started recording that uh, one of the things that's really surprised me and been an amazing, wonderful surprise with the symposium is that I would say at least, well, a, a good majority of the people I have heard from directly, you know, have emailed me or filled out the surveys or that kind of thing <clears throat> are actually women, uh, heterosexual cisgender women in their 70s and 80s. Wow. And uh, multiple, multiple, multiple people who identify in those ways have written to me and said, you know, like, for example, I am an 84 year old woman. I am heterosexual and cisgender woman. And I uh, am realizing through this symposium how much room I have to grow and mm -hmm. how much I can contribute to the world by changing my beliefs and changing my perspective and continuing to grow yes. and I'm so blown away by, by this and so deeply touched and moved by it um <clears throat> not what I was expecting I thought that the majority of people who would be interested in this symposium would be maybe late 30s 40s 50s maybe identifying somewhere in the queer spectrum of something or you know, like a mix of people, but I, that's more of the bulk of what I was expecting to have show up and, and actually at least people filling out the survey, you know, which could just be people who have more time to fill out a survey <laughs> are tending to be women in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Yeah. And, and maybe yeah. people in their late thirties and forties and even fifties just don't have time to fill out a survey. Like that could be what's going on there. But Anyway, it's beautiful. It's amazing. I'm to all of you listening, <laughs> fall into any of those categories. Thank you so much for being here. And um, yeah, thank you for changing the world by, by reflecting and growing and all of, all of that, all of us are doing, I'm doing that. I'm very actively doing that through this whole experience. So yes, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah.
I feel in my heart also to speak to that particular uh, demographics, right, Martha? I feel in my heart that this archetype of the wise woman is mm. so needed. And I think, oh, I could cry talking about this, but like, I think that this wise woman archetype is something that we've really ostracized in our culture yeah. and that we haven't been listening to. And I, I really firmly believe that a lot of the crap we are seeing right now in the collective has to do with us not listening to the wise women, yeah. including the wise women in ourselves, right? Yes. And how this wise woman has so much to share, so much to give, so much to teach us. Mm. And if you are, you know, part of that demographics listening to this, or you are someone who's so in touch with your wise woman within I just bow down to you and I so honor you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you for doing the work. Yeah. Thank you. So what is the non-binary then? I actually, it's funny because I found this list a lot harder to come up with. Um, I, I think of it as a tabula rasa or like a clean slate. And it's like, okay, it's a playground, right? We can mix and match. We can use it as a blank canvas. We can consider it a mystery, or we can use this as a celebration of someone's truth, which could be emergent, could be moment by moment, could be chapter by chapter, and could be spontaneous, right? The non-binary experience and identity is, is spacious. It is inclusive by nature. It is, even though the word itself has non, right? It is saying, hey, look, outside of these bounds of the two camps, there is so much more that you can claim, that you can be, that you can tap into. It is an invitation for authentic connection, as as you and I have spoken about, Martha, of really opening up that discussion, right, of curiosity. Checking in is so powerful because it shows the other person that you are humble enough to not project your experiences onto them and not um, immediately go into assumptions. And one question I have is, you know, even if you identify strictly as a man or as a woman, that maybe we're all constantly in flux, right? Your definition of what it means to be a man or a woman will also be changing and evolving throughout time. And so in a sense, there is an inherent fluidity to that. So here are some mercurial invitations. What if the gender binary is a categorization useful for statistical studies rather than a moral, spiritual, or even societal truth? Something that I've learned a lot from having statistics background is that for creating academic papers and studies, it is very important to have categories because otherwise nothing, you cannot draw conclusions and conclusions can be helpful. They can be life-saving, they can be life-changing. And what if we don't take them as how we are supposed to live as humans, right? Again, going back to that idea, even if you, your name is Ashley, and then there's another Ashley, doesn't mean that your life experiences are supposed to be the same, even though if I were to do a statistical study, you, you both would fall under the same Ashley category, right? But that says nothing about who you are as humans. What if gender is a collection of colors to create the painting of our lives, of musical notes to construct the symphony of our inner expressions? Beautiful. I love that question. Mm-hmm. Yes. What if our genders are allowed to shift depending on the roles that we're craving to learn or that we're desiring to assume? Something that I've been thinking a lot about is how as we are moving through political upheavals, the dissolution of our um, trusted systems, right? As we are moving from one world to the next, as we are seeing climate change and ecological crises, something that feels important to me is is this idea of what it means to have a mutable society, right? What it means for us to begin re-examining the ways in which the boxes that we've created have not, have stopped working for us, and that maybe there are, we need to 
act in emergent ways, right? So perhaps, you know, someone like Martha is so fabulous and so talented at bringing people together into the symposium, right? Into creating an, a, a movement, right? A, an actual social, intellectual, um, spiritual movement is, is playing a very different role than maybe someone who is doing one-on-one -on -one therapeutic work, which I know you've also done in the past, Martha, right? And thinking about what does it mean to evolve ourselves in different periods of our lives, depending on the circumstances that we have around us, right? This idea about what roles do you want to assume at the moment? What roles are you here to learn in this chapter of your life? And leaning into that, right? Rather than being stuck with different ways that it needs to be, or it has to be, or things like that. And finally, what if gender is a distraction or an illusion to pursuing our spiritual truth? That maybe there is a part of us on a soul level that is so deeply undefinable and un... Um, Yeah, not something that we can we can um, put down into writing or put down into into words and and the unruliness and the sacredness, the undefinable nature of our spirits and our souls. What if that's where your spiritual path wants to lead you into, away from these ideas of the either or? All right, so we're going to get to a slightly more experimental part of our of the talk. Um, and, and here I would encourage you, if it feels accessible to you, to find a quiet place, to find a place where you can um, not be disturbed, and also um, to bring a notebook or something that you want to write. Maybe that's a Google Doc or anything like that. And, and also something I should mention is that um, this is um, part of my own personal practice, and I find this really opening and exciting. So I'm really excited to share this with all of you. Um, essentially, what I've done here is, is to create a pathway in vocation to bring in the energy of Mercury into our space and to see what possibilities can open up for us. And so later, I will have journaling prompts and while I'm speaking, I'll be speaking the journaling prompts out loud, but I welcome you to just pause at any time if you need more time to, to journal and to write words. And allow this experience to be play. Allow this experience, you know, in the spirit of Mercury, right? Allow this experience to be not um, didactic and yet also perhaps still deeply educational and deeply illuminating, right? Doesn't have to be this big, thing. Um, and also, if you want to bring any items that feel right for you, if you want to create a little bit of ritual space, totally welcome to do that. But as I always say, your most important shrine is yourself and your practice. There's no need for any things if you don't want them. Okay. So I would um, encourage you if you feel if it feels available to you to just bring in a little bit of movement. And just tuning into the body, we've been talking a lot and we've been considering all these very intellectual ways of looking at this topic. And now we are bringing consciously, intentionally our whole being into the space. Taking a deep breath. If it feels accessible to you, maybe you might want to close your eyes. or simply inviting in a meditative state of being. Maybe you can look at a far distance and just letting your whole body relax. Relax in the chair or on the floor that you're in or in your bed. Just allow your whole being to relax and to be in a state of receptivity.
bringing awareness to your breath, in through your nose, out through your mouth. And with, with each exhale, allowing your breath to get a little deeper, your body to soften. And allowing the force of gravity to be felt, to be part of your experience. Noticing which parts of the body your attention is now settling into as you're bringing your attention towards gravity, maybe the soles of your feet, maybe around your pelvis area or the base of your spine. Just allowing yourself to be the whole being that you are today, feeling your sense, sense sensations in the top of your head all the way down to the soles of your feet. Connecting yourself to earth. And trusting that you are always a part of earth. That you are the child of earth. And allowing yourself to notice any distracting energies, whether inside your body or in your energetic space around you and allowing that energy to be released from the base of your spine. Just releasing any distracting energies down into the earth, giving it to mother earth to be composted. Filling yourself with your own life force energy, with your own unique frequency. And from the space of receptivity, of trust, of relaxation, let us invoke Mercury into our space. Eternal student of life, visioner of unborn realities, in transit, in between, within and without, the above, the middle, the below. Show us the playful dimension of truth. Access healing narratives hidden from plain sight. Retrieve messages lost in translation. Access realms of free thoughts and oceanic dreams. Disrupt false constructs that keep us small aid us with clean and clear communications. Show us our truth as seen through the lens of infinite love. Grant us the agility to birth a new world in clarity and in truth. Giving yourself a moment here to notice any shifts your physical body, your energetic body, your emotional body, and also in your mind. And when you feel ready, as you feel ready, we can begin exploring some questions that I have here. For me, I like to open my eyes in this moment. This is totally optional. You may also just want to continue to, to stay in meditation, but I like to write my thoughts. And if that's you, just trusting that even if you have your eyes open, it is not going to disrupt our connection, that our connection is settled and established. So the first question is, what role does the gender binary narrative play in human lives? 
what role does the gender binary narrative play in human lives? Next question is how does the imposition of gender binary narrative impact me on a personal, familial, or ancestral level? How does the imposition of gender binary narrative impact me on a personal, familial, or ancestral level? How does the gender binary narrative serve me, if at all? How does the gender binary narrative serve me, if at all? So here, with compassion, without judgment, we're going to be noticing all the ways that perhaps we have benefited from having the gender binary narrative. next question is for you to ask to be shown a part of you that you've had to repress, silence, or compartmentalize to fit into the gender binary narrative that you're ready to connect with. So just connecting yourself with a part of you that feels ready and ripe for connection today that part of you that have had to repress, to silence, or to compartmentalize so that you can fit into this gender binary narrative. Ask this part of you, what messages do they want to share with you? What messages do they want to share with you? Which ally from the non-human world are ready to assist you in rewriting your personal narratives of the gender binary? Which ally from the non-human world are ready to assist you in rewriting your personal narratives of the gender binary? Next question is what spiritual or spirit level truth am I ready to see about my own gender expression? What spiritual or spirit level truth am I ready to see about my own gender expression? The final question is what role am I here to play in rewriting the gender binary narrative? What role am I here to play in rewriting the gender binary narrative? So you're welcome to stay in this space for as long as you would like, but if you feel ready, you may begin to close the space by tuning back into your body you can pat your body a little bit. I like to pat my belly, mm -hmm. tap my chest and just signaling that I'm ready to come back to the space. And knowing that you don't have to download all of the information all at once, just the part that is most important for you to see today. Okay, so I am curious, Martha, to hear if there's anything you would like to share, whether from that experience or as we come to a close here. Sure, um, the main thing that's coming up for me personally in those questions is, um, <clears throat> I've talked a lot about in, in a lot of the other, <clears throat> the other recordings with other speakers that my Venus is in Aries in my eighth house conjunct my south node and Chiron. So my experience of 
my own quote unquote feminine has been like a journey of realizing that um, it's been very complicated, you know, like Venus and Aries is, is not necessarily what we expect. They have that energy is a combination that society doesn't tend to expect, like a very warrior, warrior S kind of energy. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I, so I've had on the one hand, I've been, I've been realizing that throughout this symposium, I've been really talking a lot about how for me, it's really important to bring in the the dark feminine again. Like so, my Venus. If if you consider Venus having to do with the feminine, which mm-hmm. so it, anyway, you can go either way on that. But um, my personal experience of myself as the feminine, regardless of the astrology, is very much definitely tied to the dark feminine and like the powerful feminine who is um yeah brings in a lot of healing power a lot of uh like creative life force energy you know like the life force energy that created the stars created the galaxies and the cosmos um and and that is tied to energies like black moon lilith and you know the lilith archetype and the eris archetype and all that kind of stuff so i've been focused on that a lot but what I'm noticing as I'm sitting here today <clears throat> is that the energetics that are actually alive for me right this minute is that there's a, also this other side of me that really, really is needing to be explored, which is me as more of the vulnerable, receptive, quote unquote, feminine, just receptive. Like, again, I don't know if it's genderized or not, but I, I have been in my life, in this lifetime, and I, and a lot of other lifetimes, very strong and like a leader and yes, <clears throat> the one in charge, the one doing everything for everybody. <laughs> like I'm a single mom, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, and then there's a, a part of me that isn't so explored where I want to surrender and I want to be vulnerable and cry and have someone there to catch me, you know, and I've got like, I worked for child welfare services. I literally saved children's lives. Like that was my role was to swoop in and, and like take charge and um, yes, it literally saved lives. So that's been a big part of my experience in this lifetime and then other lifetimes. And yeah. And so now what about, what about me <laughs> getting, you know, nurtured or taking the, anyway, that so that's what's alive for me right this minute that's so beautiful Mm -hmm. thank you martha it makes me think of two things the first one is what does it mean for that venus and aries to be communicating with venus and libra right like what does it mean for us when we have i i do this a lot with my mercury actually when my mercury in pisces is like i can't do this i'm like (laughs) okay what would a mercury in virgo do right and begin, uh, yeah, to me, that's like, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's a name for it, but I know in evolutionary astrology, we talk about Pluto's polarity point, yeah. right? And I like to think of that as like creative astrology, you know, like what does it mean to be going into that far land and starting to investigate resources you don't naturally lean into, right? Yeah. Yeah. And also the other thing that was brought up as you were sharing was this idea that sometimes what the society has imposed upon us it's like Martha you were born on this female body and you're supposed to act like a girl can be so traumatizing Mm -hmm. right and it can feel like the least accessible part of who we are Mm -hmm. like the other day I was thinking that you know sometimes my resistance towards leadership has to do with the fact that I was born in a male body and I was always forced to be a leader Mm -hmm. without caring for myself but now that I've spent you know years learning how to care for myself can I bring awareness to maybe reclaiming that part of myself that wants to lead that wants to take charge right and do it in a way that feels in alignment and resonant with who I am today Mm -hmm. 
yeah yeah it doesn't need to be this or that it can be both or we can yeah we can combine them we can go back and forth we can include other things yeah yes exactly Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you so i want to share some quotes just for us to to end here um this is from alok menon um who wrote the the small but mighty treatise called Beyond the Gender Binary. And it's a longish quote, but I think it's beautiful. So I'm gonna share it with you. Gender is a story, not just a word. There are as many ways to be a woman as there are women. There are as many ways to be a man as there are men. There are as many ways to be non-binary as there are non-binary people. This complexity is not chaos, it just is. We don't need to be universal to be valid. We should be able to decide what the clothes and the colors we adorn, the bodies we inhabit, and the people we love mean to us. There should be no boys' clothes or girls' clothes, just clothes. Mm -hmm. Separating gender from norms create infinite possibilities for us all. We get to narrate what our bodies, experiences, and interests mean. Without the gender binary, there will be no more restrictive definitions of a woman and man and masculinity and femininity. Instead, there will just be your definition, one of many. Objects, emotions, and careers will not be masculine or feminine, but they will be adventurous or compassionate. We will develop more precise language to describe ourselves and the beauty around us, more just practices to respect ourselves and one another. Yeah. I really love this idea of no masculine and feminine careers because that was something that I personally <laughs> feel like I had to deconstruct a lot. Oh, so, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just I just took a picture of this so I could text it to my 15-year-old. <laughs> oh, I love that. That book is so beautiful. And, <laughs> and I love how um, Alok speaks from this place of really not brushing away the hardship that they experience of being a um, trans, non-binary, femme-presenting person, but that also there's so much hope in in that treatise, so I highly recommend it. So here, I think this is my last words, Um, unless there are other slides that I'm forgetting. To fellow seekers who are in touch with what exists beyond the gender binary, know that it is not only pain that brought you here, it's the truth that brought you here, and more importantly, your innate love for the truth. May that truth and that love remind you that you've always been free. Beautiful. Yes, I think, again, in the non-binary experience, there can be a lot of pain. And I think that what I want to impart here is to also see the love and to see this beautiful realm of possibilities. To me, that's what really our spiritual practice is for. It is for us to remember that we have access to infinite spiritual wisdom and insight so that we can go down into the depths, right? So that we can investigate, we can change, we can heal what we're meant to in this moment in our lives. Mm -hmm. The two are not separate. The light and the dark are always coexisting. Mm And some gratitude and acknowledgement as we close here. Um, the work of Helen Vanderheide um, has been really helpful for me in creating my invocation to Mercury. Um, Alok Menon, whom I have mentioned before, my astrology teachers, Britton LaRue, Sabrina Monarch, Diana Rose Harper, and Chris Brennan, and all of my friends and mentors who have assisted me in embracing this multitude of my personal artistic and spiritual expressions. Finally, if you would like to stay in touch, um, my website is www.natechimusic.com. It's my home on the internet and you can sign up for my newsletter. 
um, I think I am well overdue for a slight change to also maybe make space for not just my musical, but my mystical practices. But um, for now, it still works. So you can find me also on Instagram at Nate underscore Chi. Um, that is my music name. And I do astrology and Akashic readings. And recently, probably my most favorite ways to connect with people is through my podcast, because I just really love my podcast. And I would love to have you soon, um, Martha, once you yeah. recover from this symposium <laughs> and all the you know, Virgo rising magic that you've um, done to make it go so smoothly and so beautifully. Um, and yes, I've been having conversations with um, people who are in touch with their spiritual path, with their spiritual process, with their learnings. And I am just super honored to have these conversations with people. And I really would love you to tune into that if that resonates with you. Wonderful. I think that's it for me. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank so, you, Martha. So good. And I am so appreciative that you have allowed me to re-record this conversation. Oh, yeah, no, <laughs> I think it was great. Like I said, that um, you know, it, was, it helps. It helps me tie tie back in that one thing I feel sad about. So yeah. maybe I'll, it'll help me feel a little less sad. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. but yeah no this is an ongoing conversation not only for us but for our world so absolutely i guess it can't be like perfect in 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 the moment yes yeah. i'll keep going thank you, thank so, you much. so much yeah and we we will definitely connect again and yes i would love to be in your podcast and for sure we'll keep going with all of this yes Thank you. Thank you.